want to talk about a, a kind of a specific issue today. Uh, you can see in your bulletin, we're going to be talking a, a bit about authority. Uh, you, you think about authority a little bit, and you, you can see how important it is, how significant it, it is. Um, every branch of our military places a very, very uh, significant importance. They really emphasize um, authority, don't they? We could only imagine the state of our uh, national defenses and the, the condition of our, our nation with, without that emphasis on authority that our nation's military, all branches, uh, place on authority. Uh, could you imagine the family condition? Could you imagine the, the status, the state of a family and the, the children that are produced by those families that, um, you know, if... if proper authority wasn't acknowledged, wasn't honored. Uh, we actually get to see that one, unfortunately. We, we see what that turns out like. We've seen the generations that it has produced. I'm not picking on any particular uh, generation. We just see how uh, the, the rock has just crumbled a little bit more, a little bit more with every generation. So we see what happens when that authority doesn't get honored in the home like it should. What would be the condition of the Lord's church? and the spiritual status of individual Christians if proper authority, um, if, if proper uh, acknowledgement and honoring the authority of the Lord, if that wasn't a emphasis. Well, we get to see that one played out in real time too, don't we? We've seen what that does. You know, we're holding steady here. We're not perfect, but we're holding, we're holding fast. And we're holding strong. Uh, but we see churches around us. We see the religious world around us and the secular world. We see what, what has happened because many people aren't honoring the Lord's authority. They're kind of just taking things for their own, just doing things what, the way it feels good for them, the way that they think seems right, or, or comparing it to the, the corporate world and making it you know, kind of like the way businesses run and, and charitable organizations rather than having a, um, a rule by the Lord, allowing, the God, uh, allowing God to be the king, not just savior, but to actually be Lord, honoring that kind of authority. We see that. So uh, looking at authority in, in every instance, I mean, that's just a few. We can see the significance and we can see the significant uh, negative impact it has when people don't honor authority the way they should. Well, today marks uh, week five of our, our message series going through Jude. Uh, Jude, contending for the faith is what we're calling it. Uh, this series where we're taking our time going through the book of Jude, this letter that Jude wrote as an appeal to Christians to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to us, right? The saints. And I'm calling this week's message authority issues. Authority issues. You see, the men that Jude has been warning us about since verse 4, you remember those certain persons who have crept in unnoticed? Those men that Jude's been warning us about since back in verse 4, they had authority issues. Jude is going to show us here in verses 8 through 10 today that these certain persons who have crept in unnoticed, crept into the church unnoticed, they lack a respect for God's authority. They lack a respect for the Lord's authority. And again, we can all imagine, we can all see what it looks like if you let that run rampant in the church. That attitude, that, that attitude that, that lacks the proper authority for the Lord, or giving the Lord his proper authority. And so we've been having a, a big idea, kind of a takeaway that first of all we want to set in our minds. We've been doing this each week, um, well since the second week after the introduction. But we've been doing this, where this is the idea that the, the whole message feeds into. This is kind of the one sentence overall theme, and get this in your mind as we take off, and then walk away with this, right? Here's the big idea. The church must be careful to understand and honor the authority of the Lord lest we become guilty along with the condemned deceivers, right? We're going to look at those condemned deceivers and we, the church, need to learn from this, this right here, that we need to be careful to understand, first of all, and then honor, right? Understanding is one thing and then putting it into practice and honoring it is another, because if we don't, if we don't understand it, we don't honor the Lord's authority, we will become guilty along with those condemned deceivers that have been used as an example for us. This, this negative example has been shown to us so that we won't do what they did. So that's the, the big idea. So let's read through the text now, uh, and we'll break things down and see what we can learn 
from all this about understanding and honoring the authority of the Lord. So look at Jude verses 8 through 10 today. Jude verses 8 through 10. Jude writes these words. He says, yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. So what we're gonna do this morning is uh, ask three questions and let Jude answer those questions with these three verses, right? Jude does not set up three questions and answer them, you, you see that, but we're gonna ask three questions that are important that are gonna help us learn kind of what we were saying we need to learn from our, our big idea. We're gonna ask three questions and let Jude in these three verses answer those questions. So let's start with this question right here. Uh, where is this going? If you look at verse eight, where is this going? He says, yet in the same way these men, okay, we've been talking about them for a while, their, their influence and their doctrine and what they're doing and saying and, and the, the dangers, where is this going? Jude says, in the same way these men also by dreaming defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile angelic ma majesties. Now, who are these men that we're talking about? Who is, who is Jude referring to when he says these men? Well, again, it's those, those certain persons who have crept into the church. Uh, notice that we're mentioned in verse 4. If you remember back to last week, just last week, uh, verses eight, 5 through 7 that we looked at, those were, were Jude taking a moment to mention a few examples of disobedience and the wrath of God, the punishment that those folks received, right? And now, now as we come to verse 8 here, Jude is connecting these men to those examples of disobedience from the previous three verses. So you see, we're talking about the guys that were first mentioned in verse four, and then in verses five through seven, we get these examples of disobedience. They weren't talking about those men, but they were talking about those three different examples from the past, right? The Israelites who were delivered out of Egypt and then subsequently died in the wilderness, and then we ended with the, the Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. He mentioned all those guys. So we started with these certain persons who have crept in unnoticed, then we brought up three examples from history, and now when we get to verses 8 through 10, he's saying, in the same way, these guys, right? These guys from verse 4, in the same way as these examples I just told you in verses 5 through 7. In the same way, these are the guys that we're talking about, and he's connecting them to those examples. This is the reason he brought up those examples. These men who have crept in the church unnoticed are like those heathens in, in Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities surrounding them, all those examples. That's what he's saying there. And Jude mentions some of their guilty actions, doesn't he? We see that at the end of the verse. He says these men do three uh, bad things by dreaming. And when he says by dreaming, he just means that they do these things as they're carried away by their evil imaginations, by their wicked thoughts, right? They, they have these ideas and they act on them, right? You ever had an idea that if you had acted on, you'd have really created some trouble in your life? You'd cre have created a mess with God? Yeah, I think we all have thoughts from time to time and we don't act on them. These guys are carried away by their evil imaginations. They, by dreaming, by thinking, by creatively coming up with evil ideas, acted on those things, right? So if we look here at the text in verse eight, Jude answers our question, where is this going? The, the behavior and the influence of these ungodly men who have infiltrated the church, who have crept in unnoticed, it results in or it leads to defiling the flesh, first of all, right? We see that defiling the flesh. You see, their thoughts don't just stay in their head. They don't just stay in the, the mental realm of, of thought. They, they are coming out in their behavior. These aren't just attitudes or far off thinking that they have. These people are acting on their thoughts, like we said. And it always works like this. It always works like this. Jesus explained in Matthew chapter 15, verses 19 through the first half of verse 20. He said, for out of the heart, okay? So not just that they're in the heart, but it's coming out. Out of the heart come Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanders. These are the things which, here's a familiar word in the context of what we're talking about. These are the things which defile the man. Jesus explained this. What's on the inside comes out. What's taken in will be acted out. And when it's bad, for example, false doctrine being learned from those with impure motives, which is exactly what Jude is talking about here, 
It's going to end in people being defiled by it, contaminated by that sin, having their hearts and their minds polluted by it, uh, not just their heart and their mind, but their status before God. It's going to contaminate that. It's going to ruin this thing. They'll be defiled by these things. Those who promote the false doctrine and those who espouse their teaching will, will become defiled by it eventually because eventually they will act on it. And remember, in the case of many of the Gnostic ideas like Jude is dealing with here and, and we were dealing with back when we were uh, going through 1 John, these Gnostic ideas that his audience is dealing with, they were promoting the ideas that, that spirit is good, flesh is bad, so whatever you do, many of them landed on this line of thinking, whatever you do in the flesh doesn't matter a bit. It does not affect your spiritual well-being. So, what's the logical conclusion? Eat, drink, be merry, sin it up. Do whatever feels good. As soon as you think, as soon as you dream of something you could do that, that might be fun, might be interesting, might be shocking, I don't know what you're going for, go for it. Do whatever feels good. You can see how these ungodly shysters, as we called them a couple of weeks ago, you can see how they could creep into a church and turn people away from the Lord, can't you? Their ideas are always self-serving. It's always something that's going to feel good, something you want to do. It's always directed toward fleshly lusts and selfish desires, always. So what do we do with this then? What do we do? Well, we need to always be examining what we're hearing, right? Any and all teaching, any and all doctrine, any and all uh, opinions on Scripture, we need to be uh, thinking through those things in certain ways. Uh, first of all, of course, we need, to, we need to follow the example of the Bereans, right? You know, we always bring them up. We need to uh, look in the scriptures to make sure that we are, are learning what is actually Bible truth, correct? We've seen these verses before. Uh, it says in verses, uh, Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 11, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. Okay, so we know we're in Berea. And when they arrived, where? Yeah. They went into the synagogue of the Jews. Where was that synagogue of the Jews? Berea, yeah. Yeah, and he says, now these were more noble-minded. Who, who were these? The Bereans, yeah. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness. Now that would be cool if we could get the church to, to, to be receiving the word with great eagerness as a, as a whole. They received it with great eagerness. And then listen to this, examining the scriptures daily. Examining the scriptures. Examining is, is one thing, and it's a big thing. And then examining them daily for a purpose. What was that purpose? To see whether these things were so. To see whether this was legitimate truth or, or just, you know, self-serving fleshly uh, teaching, false doctrine, that sort of thing. So like the Bereans, we need to do this. Receive the word with great eagerness, examine the scriptures daily to see whether what we're hearing, what we're, what we're learning, uh, what we find someone writing about or preaching or what have you, to make sure that it's true, that these things are so. But Additionally, and here's the, the big one I think, we need to be wise and mentally, mentally think, where's this going? Like our question, where is this going? Where is this leading? Anything you're taught, you ought to be able to pause, take a step back, a deep breath, examining the scriptures, and think to yourself, if I follow this teaching wholeheartedly, if I take this to heart, if I follow this with every fiber of my being, where, was, where will this lead me? Where will I end if I follow this? Because some things sound good on the surface. And you're like, you know, I, I, think, I, think, I think that's true. I think he's got a point there. Well, well, don't get too excited. I mean, receive with great eagerness. But don't get too excited just yet until you've paused and thought through things. Because sometimes you're like, you hear somebody explain something and you're like, oh man, I've believed practically the exact opposite of that for a long time. And he just made that make a lot of sense. Well, how did you believe that other thing for so long? Because you didn't go so far into it to think, if I actually do this, if I live my life like this is the truth here, if I live my life like this doctrine is actually what the Bible is saying, where will this lead me? Where will this lead me? We've got to ask ourselves those questions because doctrines are out there like uh, God just wants me to be happy, right? That, that's one example. God just wants me to be happy. Well, where would that lead us? Where, where's this going? If that's all God wants, your personal, individual happiness, if I believe that, if you believe that, where does that end up uh, leading us? Where, how does that affect our behavior? How are we gonna live our lives if we believe that truth? Another example, some people say in the end, I just think God's gonna save everybody regardless. They always tack that on there, regardless. Regardless of what? 
You know, where's this leading me? God's going to save everyone regardless. Again, big question. Regardless of what? What might someone come up with to do? What might someone, by dreaming, end up doing? What, what may come out of their mind and out in their actions, and God's going to save them regardless? How's that going to affect people's behavior? If everybody in the world is preached to and told, look, more than likely, God's going to save everybody in the end. What are people going to do? How's, what's that going to turn the world into? One more popular example. Some people say everyone has their own way of getting to heaven. Everybody's path is just as legitimate and no one can judge anybody else's. Mm. Let's think about that. Now I know these are obvious sounding examples to you guys, but I'm just, I'm just for, the, for the exercise, where does that lead us? Where does that take us, that line of thinking? If you follow this wholeheartedly, could you get to heaven through rape? Could you get to heaven through terrorism? Could you get to heaven through oppressing others? I think we've seen religions try these things, actually, and have them written into their own doctrine. In our 21st century world, guys, there's people who believe this. Now, of course, some examples are more subtle, a li little more cleverly uh, disguised, perhaps, and so we just need to always have this on our minds. Yeah, ex uh, receive teaching uh, the Word of God with great eagerness. Search the Scriptures to make sure what you hear someone saying is definitely true, but we've also got to be uh, shrewd and, and wise like this and ask, where is this going? Where is this leading? Is it leading closer to God, leading me closer to God and, and better protected in Christ, or is it leading to defilement? Is that where this would go? Because with this ungodly group of people here who had crept into the church, defilement was precisely, exactly where this teaching and their example was going. Second question, let's consider this one. What's the problem here? What's the problem? Now we're not asking what specific thing or things are they teaching that, that is wrong and what is wrong with the specific doctrine. We've touched on some of that and we'll touch on it more as we go along. That's not what this question is asking. We're asking what is, what is truly the problem? Um, what is causing? What is, what is the cause of this pe these people um, going off in the directions they're going off in? with their life and their doctrine. What's making them do this? Why, why would they do this? Look again at what Jude wrote in verse nine here. He, he said, but Michael the archangel, another example here, right? An illustration, if you will. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, what's the significance of this, this example? Why, why did Jude bring this up? telling us that Michael, the archangel, in an argument with the devil uh, about um, Moses' body, why would he tell us that he, in this situation, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you? Well, it's interesting. It's interesting because Michael himself had great authority, nothing on par with God, no one's saying that. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But, but he was no, you know, just bottom rung of the ladder kind of being. Revelation 12, 7 describes Michael as leading an army of angels in a war against the devil. Daniel 12, 1 calls him a great prince and a guard. And Daniel 10, 13 refers to him as one of the chief princes. And bear in mind, all of this is in the spiritual, angelic realm, right? We're talking about a being with a very high level of responsibility and trust here. We're also talking about a being who knew very well the guilt of the devil, knew very well the, the punishment and the judgment that he had coming, that he deserved, and he knew it was for sure, certainly coming from the Lord, right? He knew these things. Still, Jude says in verse 9 of our text that Michael did not dare pronounce a railing judgment against the devil, but said, the Lord rebuke you. It's important to understand that the word that Jude uses here for rebuke is not the kind of rebuke we're commanded to do to one another, right? It's, it's not that in the spirit of restoration, restoring a Christian to a right relationship and proper behavior to go to them with love and gentleness. It, that's not what this is talking about. This word that's been translated as rebuke, but the actual uh, Greek word that was used refers to formally, officially delivering the merited or deserved penalty. 
So this is saying, I know what you've got coming to you. I know what God's going to do to you. And so I'm going to rub your nose in it. Or I'm going to actually take this into my own hands and, and do it to you. Because God wants you to, to die anyway. And so I'm going to be the one to put the knife. Th That's kind of what this is talking about. Formally delivering the merited or deserved penalty. It's merited. It's deserved. You're going to be the one to do it? Michael wasn't going to do that. Right? Despite the fact that Michael knew obviously what the devil had coming to him in the form of punishment from God, he didn't dare rub his nose in it. Michael, one of the, the prince, uh, chief princes, the Bible says, among the angels, a leader of angelic armies, a, a general, a captain, a commander, whatever you want to call him, he respected the Lord's authority so much so that he did not presume to take this judgment from God. So what we have here is a very powerful display of how the Lord's authority should be respected by every single person, every single one of us, in every single aspect of life, every single situation, under any and all circumstances, conditions, scenarios, blah, 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 yada, you name it, you should be respecting the Lord's authority in any situation that you're in. There's no, there's no way around it. There's no exclusions. Well, that one time I was insert your excuse here. And that's why I didn't insert your overstepping your bounds there. The, every single time. If we're going to learn from this and apply this lesson to our lives, which is what we're supposed to do with Scripture. It's living and active. We're supposed to put it to use. It's a practical book. We've got to pause and be sober-minded enough to ask ourselves, how often are we tempted to do this, to, to overstep our authority and to assume what is the Lord's proper authority? How often do we do this? I know sometimes as we're interacting with the world out there, we're tempted to be uh, the, the witnesses of the, the spiritual crime, also the jury, also the judge, and uh, I don't know, the bailiff, you know, we're, we were everything. And we're like that, in the snap of a finger, all of a sudden we boom, 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 boom. We've, we figured it all out. And, and we're ready to pronounce the judgment, right? We see people who aren't like us and somehow we think we know everything about them. Again, a snap of the fingers. We see people who we don't think would ever repent. We look at people and we suppose that that person, will, that person, you know, they'll never be saved. And then we can even explain, we can justify why God would agree with us. We consider some people to be too far gone. We have one conversation with people and we write them off. We get irritated by uh, one thing one person said one time and instantly we claim our authority to shake the dust off of our feet and move on. Just boom, real quick. Not, not terribly patient a lot of times. And I say this from experience. These are the issues that I have encountered uh, in myself and been like, Jake, what a doofus. What are you acting like that for? Why are, you, why are you thinking that way? Why aren't you patient and forgiving and merciful and, and graceful like your Lord? But we assume authority that isn't ours in, in other just as dangerous ways as well, don't we? Sometimes we're tempted to apologize for something that God said in his, his word. Sometimes we're tempted to tell people that we're just certain that their recently departed loved one is in a better place when we don't know that. We don't know that information. And many times, the, the circumstances, the situation, would point to the contrary. Sometimes we're tempted to explain away doctrines that, that make us uncomfortable, or we fear might make somebody else uncomfortable. Sometimes we just flat out want to do church our way, and we, we come into this place for whatever time it is, you know, whether it's Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday, or, or Wednesday, wh whatever the situation is, we just come in here as the Lord's people on the Lord's day, and we just, we just come in here and don't even give a single thought to what God wants today, what God has commanded today. I put it up at the top of the little welcome screen. It's not up there now, so you can't see it. But I put it up at the top of the, the welcome screen this year when we turned the, the page to uh, January, I think it was. You know, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Like, that's when we come in here, we're supposed to give thought to that. When you're laying in bed and that, that alarm's going off and you're thinking, oh, I don't know about today. Or, or on Saturday night when you're thinking like, you know, I may do this so that tomorrow is going to be very hard. You're supposed to be thinking about, no, no, no. What does God want tomorrow from me? I mean, what does God want from me today or any day? But like when you're considering showing up, when you're considering, you know, changing around your schedule to be here, 
You're supposed to think about what does God want from his people on his day. But many times we don't give any, any of that thought. I've caught myself many times just as guilty as anybody. Guys, if Michael the archangel understood that he didn't have the authority to rebuke the devil himself, then certainly we would do well to take some time to really consider if there are ways that we are overstepping our authority and just doing things our own way or doing things that we, we think, well, God will, God will like it this way when that's not what he said and we just haven't given any thought to it or we won't give thought to it. This was the problem of those certain persons who had crept into the church unnoticed. They weren't concerned about or giving consideration to the authority of God. So now the third and final question that we have here is how did this happen? How did this happen? In, in verse 10, Jude writes, but these men revile the things which they do not understand. They're reviling things they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning, right? illogical, not, not actually thinking through consequences or anything else. Like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. So unlike Michael, the, the, this archangel who fully understood and respected God's authority, these men, this group of people who Jude says crept into the church unnoticed, they revile things they're ignorant of. They revile things they don't understand. They don't know really even what they're doing. You can almost hear, if you want to give them a little credit, you can hear the Lord saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But we're told now they have no excuse. In this instance, these guys are without excuse. And it says that they destroy themselves by ignorantly acting on their fleshly instincts. See what they're doing? Qu quite a situation to be in. To revile, to blaspheme, to curse, to speak poorly of these things that you don't even understand because, well, either you haven't given it enough thought, you just chose not to, or you suppress the truth. Quite a situation to be in. How did they get to this point? How did this happen? Jesus said in John 3, 20, he said, Everybody who, everyone who does evil hates the light. And listen to this, does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Uh, guys, a person can't be saved unless they first of all come to the light, right? This is an action you have to do. But God says, the Lord Jesus says here, those who love evil, they won't do it for fear that their deeds will be exposed. The very thing that could save them, they won't come to it. Because they're, they're afraid of having their deeds exposed, it says here. They avoid the light. They avoid the truth of, of God's word. They avoid acknowledging the Lord's authority. Acknowledging, recognizing, uh, and honoring that authority. Paul explained it like this at the beginning of Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He said, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. Hear what they're doing? suppressing the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that, here it is again, they are without excuse. Again, unlike Michael the archangel who wouldn't dare pronounce a railing judgment against the devil, even though he knew what the devil had coming to him. Jude says in verse 10 here that these bad actors we've been talking about who have crept into the church and notice they revile with things they don't even know about. For one reason or another, they don't know. They don't understand. They're ignorant of these things. And to revile these things, again, it means that they're blaspheming. They're degrading. They're cursing. They're speaking lies about God and great spiritual things that they're ignorant of. They don't even realize how bad what they're doing really is. And that's a shame because they're without excuse. It is just as bad as it is whether they know it or not. What a terrible thing. What a dangerous way to live your life. But we see and we hear people doing this all the time, don't we? Of course, they're the obvious ones, the, the protesters and the mobs and the masses who shout obscenities at, at, at Christians and spiritual things and this sort of thing. And then there's people in the church Doing it in a more subtle fashion, trying to dismantle Scripture, calling into question the validity of God's Word, saying, well, I believe this, but I don't know if I can get on board with, with that. And all of this, whatever example you, you come up with, all of this, because they won't do the work of, of learning. 
of investigating honestly, of studying earnestly, of seeking genuine conviction about these matters. And so here we are at, at our question again, how do we get here? How do we get here? <laughs> this is it right here. This is how we got to the point of having to watch out for the ungodly, those who turn the grace of God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord. This is how we got here. This is how we got to having to watch out for others and getting ourselves drawn into uh, defiling themselves and lacking proper respect for the, the Lord's authority and reviling angelic majesties and things that, that we're ignorant of that we don't even know about because we haven't learned. That's how we got here, a lack of knowledge. People for a variety of motives refusing to learn about these things. In verse 10, whoops, it's, it was up there already, wasn't it? Verse 10 ends, Jude saying that the things they know by instinct, those things, they're ignorant and they, re, they revile these great spiritual things that they're ignorant of, they revile them, but the things that they know by instinct like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Now this destruction is probably uh, both present and prophetic, right? I mean, what they're doing to their minds and their bodies through their de defilement, through their behavior, this influence, uh, it's, it's defiling them now, it's destroying them now. But in a prophetic way, we know, if not repented of, we know the ultimate end of this kind of behavior, right? That, that undergoing the, the punishment of eternal fire that we talked about last week, that's it right there, right? So what do we do with this information that, that we just learned? With where is this, or where, how did this happen? How do we get here, right? Well, there are people inside the church and outside the church who are in the nasty habit of spiritual laziness. They don't want to read. But God gave us a book with, with words, right? They don't want to study but we're dealing with the deepest concerns of God and man. They don't want to be diligent, but we're dealing with the God of, of details, right? The, the God who, who perseveres with and for us. They don't want to be thorough and precise, but we're created uh, by and accountable to a God who is, who is accurate and precise. And without his accuracy and his precision and his forethought, foreknowledge and all these things, present life and eternal life wouldn't be possible. And then there are those who aren't spiritually lazy, but like Romans chapter 1 said, they just, they, they suppress the truth. They know what they know, and they even suppress that and, and purposely won't learn anymore. They don't want to face the facts, and they don't want to acknowledge the truth. They don't want to face the facts, they don't want to acknowledge the truth. Now what's the problem with that? You cannot be saved without facing the facts and acknowledging the truth. Those are the very things that are required for us to be saved by God. See, if we allow ourselves to be influenced by those who ignore or suppress the truth, we'll eventually find ourselves following their lead. That's, that's the real danger here. That's the lesson we definitely need to, to learn from this. We will become those who ignore or suppress the truth, and we will become those who revile things that we are ignorant of, and it's our own fault that we're ignorant of it. And following animal-like instincts will, will destroy ourselves. Now, our minds, our bodies, and later, our, our, our eternity will throw it away. And we'll undergo the punishment of eternal fire. At church, it's so important that we remember the appeal from, from Jude here. This call, this appeal to, to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Remember, that's it's kind of our theme verse here. Not kind of, it is. It's Jude's theme verse. It's the reason he wrote the letter and everything he says is because of this call, right? We need to contend earnestly because of this. Here's some examples. Watch out for these guys, blah, blah. All this because certain persons have crept in unnoticed. You need to contend earnestly for the faith. It all comes down to this because certain persons do creep in unnoticed. We do need to make it our duty to know the truth, to fight for the faith that saves us and can save others. And we need to identify those who aren't on board with this mission and reject their influence. We don't have to be mean and nasty. In fact, we shouldn't. But we also shouldn't be so dumb to, to let them influence us and lead us to hell. We're smarter than that. But sometimes we kind of back down. Sometimes we don't heed the call to stand up and to contend earnestly, 
to fight for that faith, to stand up for it, and to not let it go. And to say it is our, our duty, it is our responsibility. We have been called to do this, not by some preacher, not by a friend or somebody who challenged us at a revival, by God in his word. He said this is your responsibility, you need to do this. Remember what Jude showed us about these guys. Where is this going? Where will, where will this teaching or, or this example of these people lead us? We need to remember that. Because remember, rotten doctrine produces rotten living. It will come out in your life, in your actions. They'll lead us to defiling ourselves, becoming contaminated by sin. And then what's the problem? The cause of this rotten doctrine that led to rotten living? It's a lack of respect for the authority of God. We need to be completely committed to respecting the authority of the Lord. And that's going to involve some serious, sober-minded self-examination to see if we might be trying to assume God's authority at times. And then finally, th this question of how do we get here? Remember those men who defile themselves and lack respect for God's authority and, and ultimately revile the things that they don't understand and they follow their, their fleshly instincts and like unreasoning animals, they destroy themselves. We need to remember that if we go after that and we start trying to scratch all these fleshly itches, it's going to end up in our own destruction. And we're going to lead others there too. It's not just our blood, but others is going to be on our hands. Guys, what we've talked about this morning, these are even more reasons, uh, beloved, that we need to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints.